Um, welcome everybody uh, to Seed and Spark, uh, which is an ongoing expedition of a bunch of crazy people from around the world who share an interest in trying to use nature as a model for reimagining the ways we live and learn. If you're here for the first time or you've been here since the beginning, you are equal members of and participants of this community. And if you haven't seen that website, seedandspark.live, check it out, which is where you can find out about the book that, that birthed all of this. But I just want you all to know, whether you've been here since the beginning or you're here for the first time, that. This is a community of people that are trying to create through the virtual world, a space that feels meaningful, a space that you want to return to, and a space where we can not only think about the ways in which we want to live and learn, but can actually model that actively together. So welcome, everybody. We're so excited for you to be here. Um, we also often do a land acknowledgement at the beginning, and I want to pull up actually a useful resource, which I will do in a minute. If you're not familiar with land acknowledgements, um, it's a useful tool that will help you better locate your own spot on the planet and some of the um, cultures and people that may have lived there before you that it would be good to be aware of. In the meantime, I wonder if anybody would be willing uh, off the cuff to offer their own land acknowledgement before we start. Hmm. Which hmm. can take any form that feels appropriate and right for you. So I was thinking today um, I was in a conversation and actually Dave was on this call, this, this will feel abstract, but I was thinking about how I became a teacher. In the summer that I became a teacher, I was working in Western North Carolina, teaching rock climbing, primarily at a rock called Looking Glass Rock and a rock called Devil's Courthouse. Devil's Courthouse was a sacred spot to the Cherokee. Uh, who clearly had incredible range um, through what I consider to be um, the most beautiful part of the world, the part of the world that inflames my imagination. And it struck me that there are so many names derived from the Cherokee language of places and of events and of spots in Western North Carolina, East Tennessee, North Georgia. And yet, somehow the original inhabitants almost become invisible behind those names, um, the Cherokee names. Um, Devil's Gourd House was for millennia a gathering place for Native American tribes. It's about 6,000 feet um, and it's a stunning, bare-faced, harsh sort of setting, um, a hard place to learn how to rock climb. And um, so when I think about being in that place, I've, I've sort of developed a habit probably since the beginning of Seed and Spark of just remembering where I am, um, not just aesthetically, but in terms of the whole narrative of a people um, that is um, sort of appears in our shared memory like a ghost um, in a way. And so I want to, uh, be aware of that. And I love being aware of that when I'm up there. Get me above 2,000 feet and, um, and headed up to 6,000. That's where my imagination wants to go. Thank you, Ross. And if you didn't see it, I shared in the chat. Uh, and some people are starting to also kind of introduce themselves by way of that space. And there is a useful uh, resource uh, if you're not sure uh, what some of those stories are that precede your place. We have lots of amazing stuff tonight. Uh, but before we get to Kim Carter, Bobby is going to introduce 
tonight's musician. If you're here for the first time, we always start with music or poetry. Yes, Kim, you wanted to say something? Yeah, just in relation to the land acknowledgement, um, Gary had shared something in the Seed and Spark group, WhatsApp group, about a um, some, what do I want to say, expanding his understanding and thinking about land acknowledgement. And he mentioned a movie called Bounty that's coming out. And I just wanted to mention, I'll put a link in the chat for it. There's a screening in January and um, it's a Thursday night, but I'd love it if we could do a Seed and Spark shared, as you said, Sam, movie night. Um, yes. it's, it's really, it's a good time of year to be aware of this movie. And, and so I encourage you to just take a look and um, hope to see you in January for that. Yes, thank you, Kim. And there's the, the link. So uh, something for all of us to be able to experience together in January. Bobby. Okay, I am going to introduce our musician tonight, Nyan Bula, um, who um, not only is an amazing rock and roller, but he also works for Education Reimagined. So he's also a visionary education person too. But I just wanted to read a quick write up in the Washington Post, Chris Richards wrote about Nyan. Nyan Bula's songs, like most living things, start off tiny and then grow big. He writes them alone on an acoustic guitar and then brings them to his band, an eight piece rock and roll outfit that uses strings, horns, keys, and more to inflate his songs into capacious new shapes. So welcome, Nyan. Thanks for being here tonight and sharing a song with us. Thanks for having me. That, that's, that's great. I, would, I, would, I, would, uh, I don't even remember where you found that. <laughs> it's been so long. Um, really appreciate you guys having me here today. Um, it's uh, it's the second time um, I'm here, and that means I must have done something right. So that's fantastic. Um, uh, we are as a group finally getting out and playing some shows, uh, which is exciting. And we're doing our first kind of couple shows. We're doing Richmond and a couple things here in DC and maybe Baltimore next month. So that's exciting. Um, I have five songs that just came out this year, kind of on Spotify and all that good stuff. Oh, and we've got five <laughs> other songs that are coming out soon. And what's funny with Bobby's quote is that I've just made like one of these life changes and cut the band down to five people and move this around and changing this around and all kinds of things. So um, as most musicians are, we're very um, just always looking for something different and changing things up uh, like the guy behind me over here. So um, this song I wrote during the pandemic, um, you know, just uh, as a lot of musicians, we were just looking at the world around us and a lot of the uh, protests here in DC, the Black Lives Matter post, uh, protest and explaining that to my kids um, as a as, um, person of color also in America and, and what that means. So um, I know a lot of musicians wrote songs. So I was kind of like, ah, do I really want to write another song about this? Like everybody's written a song about this. They're all coming out this year. but. It just happened to come out and I, I thought it came out pretty good. And so we're solely recording it here in DC, but um, it's a song called American Seconds. Bobby heard about, I think a minute at a strategy meeting <laughs> for education reimagine. And so she said, oh, you gotta play the whole thing. I'm like, yeah, I will. So um, my brand is called the NRIs for now, which means stands for the non-resident Indians. And again, my name is Nyan. The song is called American Seconds. <laughs> In death we are all angels or devils. We are all complicated vessels. The faces you can hold so dear can also look like the faces of fear. These American seconds are filled with tears. These American seconds have the weight of years. Oh, these Americans, these American seconds. Imagine what you teach 
and what you believe even the strongest of us must learn to grieve a penitent man can listen and take a knee we all just want to be free these american seconds are filled with fear these american seconds have the weight of years when they can't erase the past they bury it it's time to bring change to these these american oh these americans these americans stop stomping and a marching these voices they won't stop preaching and a shouting breathing and a teaching these feet they won't stop these voices they won't stop these feet they won't stop these voices Okay, so, what? Yeah, go ahead. Do you, do you know how to do split screen? I don't know what you mean. Split screen of what? On your computer. But but what's on the two? Side by side, side, by side if, you go up to the... If, if everybody uh, could uh, uh, mute themselves, screen. I'm going to mute everybody. Okay. So you can unmute yourselves in a little bit. Um, first of all, Nyan, thank you so much. Um, not only is that a beautiful and a stirring song and the way that you uh, perform it, but particularly the message on the eve of Thanksgiving and the chips in American identity feels like a timely message. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Nyan. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, and, guys. Thank you. And it, Bobby, maybe you would share one more time the link to Nyan's music and a place if anybody would like to contribute to the virtual tip jar. Yeah. Where folks yeah. can do so. Okay. I'm going to pop that in again. Great. Yep. And uh, it's my honor now to introduce Kim. But first, I want to just give a few um, things that are coming up with regard to Seed and Spark. First of all, for anybody that's here for the first time, or even maybe some of you have been coming for a while and you never did this, if you would like to receive regular updates from the expedition about when things are happening, all you have to do is go to that website. And if you scroll down, you'll see the original call for the expedition and an, and an opportunity to inquire within. Give us your name and email, and we'll give you regular updates for everything that I'm about to say. But for now, know that next week, we're going to get to have our second game jam with the Seed and Spark deck. For anybody that has not heard about that, we are basically trying to design a deck of cards that helps people better understand and play with living systems in order to redesign our human world. And Next week, we get to actually play with those cards again. 
Um, Wednesday is our usual night. It is the night before uh, Thanksgiving. And so I'm not gonna say now, but maybe we'll shift to Tuesday. But again, we'll let you know, but we are gonna do that. And if you can make it, we'd love to have you, but that's next week. And then the first Wednesday after Thanksgiving, um, if anybody has read A Hunter-Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century by a husband and wife team of evolutionary biologists, Heather Hying and Brett Weinstein, they're going to be here to talk about this book. So really good stuff coming up. Um, I don't think there's any other stuff related to housekeeping unless, am I forgetting something, anybody? Okay, so <laughs> I get to introduce Kim. Uh, some of you have heard me say this before. I've known Kim Carter now for almost 20 years. And uh, I've been privileged to meet and I get to work with lots of really smart, really passionate, really interesting people. And I don't know that anybody has taught me more than Kim. Kim is trained as a librarian. Uh, so she has that kind of polymath tendency in her. She's a, a career educator. She's a former New Hampshire teacher of the year. And when I met her, she was only a few years into this experiment of designing a new public school for choice called Monadnock Community Connection School, or MC Squared for short. And I still remember the first time I visited MC Squared, I was like, I've never, I've never seen a school like this. Uh, not only was it a school that completely embodied democratic principles, student voice, student choice, but it was um, a loving, vibrant, um, electric place filled with kids who uh, were choosing their own path in life. And part of my own education was realizing that a lot of those kids were choosing a path that didn't involve college. And I am, I'm not ashamed to say, but I will say that when I first visited, I was still like, well, if they're not going to college, how is it a good school? <laughs> and so that's just one of the many ways that Kim has opened my eyes to a, a different, deeper level of understanding what each person needs in order to really thrive and find their path. And tonight we get to learn alongside her. So uh, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Kim Carter. Thank you, Sam. And it's undeniably been a completely mutual learning experience all along the way. Um, and I have to add the second half of your sentence. And then the school board closed us down, <laughs> right? The school. <laughs> so politics is there. We opened um, a couple other versions of it. One is still running. So anyway, there's lots of learning in, in all of those experiences. I really want us to have a conversation tonight. Um, I have a bit of a slideshow because that helps me stay focused to give you overviews of two resources and two tools. And then if, if the spirit moves us, you can play with the tools or we could just talk about them. Um, but I do hope at some point you will play with them. I do wanna say I'm a little bit intimidated following Rulan. She was amazing. If you weren't on last Wednesday, check out the um, recording because it will give you, it will re-energize you in some really profound ways. So um, I, I do wanna encourage you to take a look at the recordings on tap there. All right, um, hopefully you can all see this. Once I hit slideshow, everything disappears for me, except a few faces. Um, Many, many years ago, Sam and I went to a conference and one piece uh, in, up in Seattle, I think it was Sam, right? Pegasus. 
and one of the speakers was rolling out a new way of looking at um, community development and tackling tough problems. And he called it Theory U and he called it leading from the future um, as, as it emerges. And so I just found myself thinking that really what I wanna talk about today is what is the future waiting for us to, what I want us to talk about. So what is the future waiting for us to do today? And, and so I'm going to share some resources and tools for transformation, but I think the yearnings we feel, I like this idea that the yearnings we feel are the future pulling us forward, calling to us. Um, and so I want to operate with that kind of sensibility in mind. And I, I'm feeling a particular urgency at the moment because I was on a webinar this evening on the impact of AI on media literacy today. And I was just blown away by how much more complicated figuring out what is real, what is fact, what is opinion, and all of the ways artificial intelligence are manipulating um, the, what we see in the media every day. And there was um, the woman who presented, a librarian, said if we want our students to better evaluate, informa evaluate information, we should start by reevaluating how we teach them to evaluate. And for me, it just feeds into the whole like, our, our education system really needs us, the future needs us to think about and reimagine our, our, what we think of as education. Um, and I could digress so many ways, I've got to stick to this PowerPoint and we won't have a conversation, so I won't do that. Um, because I use the word transformation in there, I, I want to name that. I want to define what I mean when I say transformation. Um, transformation changes not just what we know, but how we see, interpret, and understand ourselves and the world around us. It's the proverbial turning and coming out of Plato's cave, where we're no longer looking at the shadows on the wall, we're looking at the world um, in all its glory. And there, there are, we can all pause, we could each pause and think about a time that we heard something, saw something, experienced something, like perhaps what it was like for Sam to come to MC Squared that time, that just changed the way we listened and understood and interacted and responded to the world around us from that moment forward. Um, and there are tools that can help us do that. I wanna pause for a minute and introduce a couple of my colleagues that are here. Um, Betsy Bradley is my comrade in arms. So Bet Betsy, hopefully you'll give a wave and a shout out. Um, she works with me through thick and thin. <laughs> Betsy and Daniel Barron and Carrie Thier are all on as well this evening, and they've been part of a transformative learning collaborative that we've a uh, collective impact grant we've, we've carried on over the last eight years or so, almost eight years. Um, so they've helped inform this work and helped me grow and learn as well. So I, I just want to give them a shout out while we're here. Um, before I really jump into the couple of resources, a few premises, some resources and tools. I wanted to start with a poem. It's called In Lakesh. And it is um, a very long poem, actually. And, this, and it's this little piece, In Lakesh, comes from the longer poem, Pensamiento Serpentino, the Chicano Approach to the Theater of Reality. And I put a link here. I'm not sure that it's a legal copyright link, but you can find the whole poem there if you want to. So, but, but I do want to read just a bit of it. Um, I actually thought about having us do a choral reading, like reading it all together. So if anybody wants to join me, I'm going to do the Spanish. Please feel free to unmute yourself and read along with me. Tu eres mi otro yo, si te hago daño a ti, me hago daño a mí mismo. Si te amo y respeto, me amo y respeto yo. And I wanted to share this for a couple of reasons. Number one, the sentiment is a way to anchor ourselves in our relationship. But I also want to say that the poem draws on some philosophical concepts that come from the Mayan people 
which is basically in Lakesh, you are my other me. Um, and it received national attention after it was banned as part of the removal of the Mexican American Studies program in Tucson Unified School District. Curtis Acosta used this poem to start every class so his students would be centered in each other, in community. And um, they banned it. And this, it was later, the ban was later ruled unconstitutional, but this is part of our context and this is part of the work that we do. QED has four guiding principles that really direct everything, um, all of our work, every aspect of our work. And so I'll, I'll share those as foundation for the tools and resources you're going to see. We're all learners with aspirations and passions which deserve to be supported in every way possible. Learning changes lives by helping us develop the will, knowledge, skill, and capacity to achieve our aspirations. Learning needs to happen in different ways. So we use various strengths and resources to engage with the world around us. And learning empowers us to co-create, excuse me, our public world and to shape the decisions that impact our lives. And we'll come back to that shaping decisions that impact our lives in just a minute. Four premises, just to, I cut out a few, but just a couple things I want to um, put out there so that you know where, like where I'm coming from with some of this stuff. We talk about equity a lot, but we don't define it too often. And we don't know if we're really talking about the same thing and sharing our perspective. So I wanna put mine out there. Um, it's a definition I first heard from Dr. Amber Kim in 2016, and it stayed with me. It, it like took root in my DNA or something that educational equity is academic achievement, but is also positive sociocultural and linguistic identity and it's equity literacy, which is the ability to recognize, respond to, and redress inequity. You have to be able to notice, you, wanna, you need to be able to respond to it, and then take action to change it, to, to shape those decisions that impact our lives. Identity is essentially our sense of self. Um, it's, a, it's an important piece to consider that while it's a developmental stage that happens in adolescence, it's developing all the time and the foundations for it happen in early childhood and we build on that all along. And I really love this perspective from Michael Nakula and Eric Tashalis that talks about identity being a reciprocal process all the time that in many ways our identities capture the stories of who we are in relation to each other. So identity is less an individual endeavor than a collective one. While our students are, are shaping and developing their identities when they're with us, we're shaping our identities through our interactions with them at the same time. It's not a one way, it's a very reciprocal relationship. And I just have to mention status because I think it's important. We talked about it a bit in our Seed and Spark Pedagogy group this past Monday, and I really love our Seed and Spark Pedagogy group, and a special shout out to Casey and Nancy for being here this evening. Thank you so much. Um, we talked about this notion. I, I encountered it in Alana Seidel Horn's book, Motivated, which is about math and engaging kids in math, but she talks about status being the perception of students' academic capability and social desirability. And she says, we can understand um, status through watching participation pattern, patterns. Status links competence to belongingness and meaningfulness, that, that these things come together through status. And she says, she, she talks about kids with high status being the ones who know they have the opportunity to shape the discourse, to dominate the discourse. So she talks about it as speaking rights. And I think we can extend that past our schools to think about who has speaking rights in our community and, and why and how does that get shaped. And then finally agency, not finally, but all of these things combine to the sense of can we leverage resources to nav navigate obstacles and create positive change in our own life? Lives, I guess I should say. So agency has components of both action 
and reflection. It's not one or the other, the two go hand in hand together. Um, and for me, all of the work that we're doing and the tools I want to, when you put all these things together, you have the ingredients for transformation. You have the ability for us to, especially through reflection, the action and reflection, not just understand, not just think, change what we know, but the how and why we understand and see the world around us and react to it. So um, here's the first resource for you to be aware of. Um, it's QED's transformational change model. It was developed over about 10 years um, and, and we developed it, but we did it with many, many incredible educators around the country. So several national meetings, bringing it to the table, having them give us feedback, doing protocols on it. It went through several iterations and then versions within those iterations. So this is 5.2 or 5.1, I think it is. Um, and it's basically, um, while, while most schools recognize the need for a shift in, in what they do, not all change is created equal. So we look at 22 indicators of learning environments across three strata of change. Traditional is usually, the changes are usually about making, um, cur improving current practices in hopes of improving outcomes. And there's tangential impact on the status quo. Transitional, change aims to change current practices, sorry, change, traditional change is about making improvements to current practices with um, an eye toward maintaining the status quo. So your outcomes are like test scores and things like that. Tr transitional aims to change the current practices so that you can improve outcomes. And that has some tangential impact on status quo but it usually is a step, still essentially stays the same. While transformational change aims to impact not only the practices, but also the outcomes and the why of what we're doing. And that the intention there is to disrupt the status quo. I show five of the 22 indicators here. The link at the bottom will give you, you can download the whole thing. Um, these five are probably the ones that are most specifically related to um, relevant to identity and agency. Um, two other quick notes, when you see three quick notes, when you see the full documents, it's in blue and it's lighter blue moving to darker blue. And that's because you need a deeper level of implementation as you move toward transformational. And each, as you move toward transformational, each one of those elements supports and reinforces the other elements. The one other piece is as you go across a row, some of these rows build on each other, like responsibility for learning. In a traditional model, it's the student's responsibility to learn. Um, in a transitional, the teacher shares responsibility with the student. And in a transformational, it's the learning team, which includes the student as well as the teacher advisor. It may include another student, a mentor, some other folks, and it definitely includes the parents. Um, and so you can build that across that one, but some of these others require paradigm shifts. And so we have breaks, we have these white spaces in that document. And that shows where you have to change the way you're thinking about the work. So there are, there are paradigm shifts represented in that whole document. Um, so for that, we built a tool. And that, and that was through years of working with districts who were really interested in using the transformational change model and hearing some of the ways they engaged people in looking at that. So we ended up with this tool that is, um, essentially it's a gap analysis tool. And the link is here. You can go and use it, and I hope you will. Um, I wanted to show you just a couple of screens so you'll understand what you're seeing. You'll get a series of 22 screens. Each screen has a question that you have to answer in two parts. And so um, you'll see expectation of success is based on. And the first part is what you believe. And the second part is your perception 
of what your school or learning or work environment is. If you hover over one of the indicators, and that's why willing and the able is in bold because I had put my cursor over it and hovered over it. You'll see a definition down at the bottom of what we mean. What do we mean by the willing and the able? We mean students who are ready for and interested in the school's learning structures gain access to a rigorous curriculum. There are variable standards and variable expectations in that setting. So if you're not sure what one of these words means, you can hover over it and you'll get a little definition in, down below. So in each of the screens, you'll pick two answers, what your beliefs are, what your work or learning environment or work environment is, school environment. Once you go through all 22 screens, you'll get a screen that looks like this. And that represents your results for those 22 in indicators. The green are places that you have a complete match. That, and it's not, it's not, oh, you're green because you're transformational. You're green because your beliefs and your environment match. That's what we're talking about. If there's a, something of a mismatch between your environment and your beliefs, you'll get yellow. And if you're sort of diametrically on opposite ends of this continuum or whatever, you'll get red. You can then click on one of those little checks and it'll tell you which indicator it was. So this white check that's right there in the middle of transitional was about learning opportunities are designed based on. If you click on it further, it will take you to, it'll, there'll be a pop-up window that says, you said your beliefs are this and your school work environment is this. And then there's a little bit of advice and it just says you're well matched, try doing this. So there's a, you know, you're matched, you're not matched, you're partially matched. And then there's a something you can do to, to continue to act on the match or the mismatch or whatever. And then there's a link to our Pinterest board, which has a variety of resources related to that indicator well, related to the, to the categories of indicators. So you can go and find more information as well. So that's all nifty. That's the individual piece. The one other piece to this is that you can choose to have people link their individual results to a facility, which is a group of people. Um, so we could have done it for Seed and Spark. We could come up, we could make a link and say, here's the code to put in to link us all, all of our individual results to Seed and Spark. If you do that, you then will see, you can, you can pull up your facility results and it will show you, it, you can pick one of the 22 indicators. So up top, this indicator was student voices represented and it shows you the um, combined results. You can't tell who any one person's results are but you can see what the distribution is of how people rated or answered those questions between their beliefs and their context. So for instance, um, eight people, their beliefs are transformational, but they feel their educational context is traditional. Now, if, if you're an administrator or a coach or even a teacher who wants to help move people, you can do the math and say, well, 16 of us believe, have beliefs that are transformational. How do we move our practice to be more transformational so we're aligned with our beliefs? And what conversations do we want to have with our colleagues who see it differently? So those are conversations. The, all of these tools are about promoting conversation and dialogue. So that's one example. Um, here's another example. So this one has this kind of, there's, there's pretty much consensus there. Um, it, it's not 100%, but it's closer to consensus. And this one, whoops, sorry, um, people are all over the map, like personal, their definition of personal, how personalization, what personalization is based on has a variety of different interpretations. They see their context fairly the same, um, but their beliefs are in different places. So you'd want to You'd want to have some conversation. Did we interpret this question the same? What are we each seeing? So, so that's an opportunity for more dialogue. And then this one is an example of um, polarization, really. 
small numbers, but still polarization. And this is around ownership for learning belongs to. And you've got uh, 19 people whose beliefs say it's they're transformational. And you can refer back to the chart to see what the definition is there. Um, and so you again, another opportunity for conversation. So this, this allows you to look at um, anonymously as a faculty or as a group of people and have some conversation about how, you know, how you're approaching things. And you don't take on all 22 at once. You pick the top three. You might go for like student voice here because it's probably going to be the most easy, the easier conversation to have. Um, and then you decide what's, what are the other two you want to use. Um, so that's, that's the transformational tool analysis. Here's another tool, um, and that's the ACOM. I'm sorry, I'm going quickly, but then I, I want you to have a chance to go in and muck around with it, play with it, talk about it, and give feedback. Um, the ACOM Neurodevelopmental Framework for Learning, are, they're constructs. So it's not the way our brain is wired, but it's a conceptualization of the mental processes involved in learning. And it's been around for over 20 years. Um, and actually Betsy's my deep, deep memory on the ACOM framework. And I'm so, so grateful to have her with me. Um, and there are a lot of resources and tools for that. But the one I wanna share with you about is the Learner Sketch Tool. And the Learner Sketch Tool is also a free tool. Um, it's a way, so we call it Learner Sketch because we wanna continually emphasize that you can readily reshape your picture of yourself. You get strategies, context, and motivation. These all change whether, what, where you can be successful. Um, it's, is all based in an absolutely bedrock belief that we are all good learners. If we weren't good learners, we'd be dead. Uh, that's that simple. We are organisms that are designed to learn. Um, and so we can create environments that give us the opportunity to, to use our strengths and to overcome challenges. So the learner sketch tool is an, uh, um, it's not a diagnostic, it's a self-report tool that allows you to go in, you answer a series of questions, well, you drag them, they're in the center here, and you drag them either to this is so me or not me, and you go through eight screens and drag those statements, and you get these little, we affectionately call them the blobs or amoebas, with one being strengths and one being challenges. They are the colors they are because of for high contrast for people who are colorblind, so they can still see the relationship between their strengths and challenges. And then you can go in and explore this. So you can click on um, the first tab is explore, and you can go in and click on A, and it'll bring up attention, and it'll explain what the three different kinds of attention are. There's a little video, um, it's kind of like a TSA animate thing that gives you more information about what attention is uh, or each of the other constructs, memory, language, that thing. You can go to strategies and there are a variety of strategies. So if you self-reported that this was a challenge, you'll get strategies that will help you um, boost your capacity, uh, do better with those things that are challenges. But and I love this, we also have strategies for leveraging strengths because we're strengths-based. So you can select your strengths and say, I wanna use this strategy and this strategy. And then you can go to your plan and see the collected strategies that you've pinned and have it, um, you can get a link and e download the PDF or have it emailed to you. Also, this is another tool where you have the option to set up a facility or a group um, so if you have a group of learners working with you, you can have them link and as the teacher, you would be able to go in and see the aggregate results. You can see how many kids said they have strengths in, in attention, mental energy, and how many said that they have um, maybe challenges in memory. Um, and that will give you access to teaching strategies. So there are strategies for strengths, strategies for challenges, and teaching strategies in there. And 
if you set it up as a facility, you can edit all of those strategies and add your own. So you could put in a strategy, go to the writing center or give Sam a call because he's the best writer I know or, you know, whatever, these different kinds of things. So that's the learner sketch tool. Um, the best way to access the learner sketch tool is Faces of Learning. And this is a project that Sam really envisioned um, 12 years ago, Sam, something like that. Um, it's, it's stood the test of time well. Uh, we, we are in the process of upgrading and updating the website, but it's here, it's live. There are great stories um, that people have shared about their best learning experience or most memorable learning experience. There are some incredible audio um, stories in there, but you can go in and get to your, set up your own learner sketch and you can do it more than once. You can see different versions of it um, to do it individually. There's also a page there that explains more information about these constructs, the science of learning page. So that's there. Those are the four links. That's enough of me talking. Um, let's have a conversation. Thank you, Kim. Um, I wonder if um, I, I mentioned once in the in the chat. Uh, there's so many. And Kim, would you take? Would you um, stop sharing just so that we can see all of the faces again? Yes. And what I'll do is put those links in the chat. Perfect. Yeah, there we go. Um, so it's a lot of remarkable educators on this call. And even if you're not an educator, don't leave because you've now wandered into the deep part of the bar where the educators are on like their seventh drink and are about to just go down the rabbit hole. Uh, so in that spirit, um, who would like to start us off, feel free to just kind of take yourself off mute. And I would encourage people, and I know Kim will support this in the spirit of this group, your questions don't all need to be one directional towards Kim. It can be questions that are basically being raised for the group in which Kim and others are invited to respond. Kim, this is uh, Stephanie Marshall. Uh, I found your presentation uh, compelling um, and the information really um, very, very powerful. I'm wondering how uh, the data, my sense was that the, the adults or the teachers or whatever, however those are aggregated or, or talked about, they, they do their analysis of beliefs, et cetera, et cetera. Do the children do their own and then are they shared? So is there an interdependence, a weaving and a, and a public sharing, I'll put public in quotes, of what different groups of participants, how they're responding so that the disconnect and the congruence can be illuminated? And Kim, before you respond, can I just say, Stephanie is a beloved member of this community who has recently had uh, an injury and is in the process of recovering. And this is our first time of being able to hear her voice. So Stephanie, we are all thinking of you. We are so glad that you are here. We hope that you continue to feel better. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, sorry, Kim, go ahead. Uh, no, I, I echo that. I'd send that Stephanie a message in chat. I don't know if you could see it, but I was so glad that you're here. Um, I love the way you're thinking about it, Stephanie. I only know of one school that's ever done that, <laughs> had the students take it and the teachers take it. Mm. Most schools keep it with their staff. Um, okay. and, and I'm assuming that you're talking about the, the gap analysis around. Yes. The, the, yes. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Most schools but, have just kept it with their teachers, but you certainly could do it. Yeah. And I know one school that has done it with teachers and students and looked at it as one aggregate, not separating out how students see it and how teachers oh, see it. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, can you talk a little bit more, Kim, about this one school who did it with the students and the staff? And well, then it's a way to create. Oh, hi, how are you? You can see the 
the students' responses versus the staff responses? Sure, you would just set up two facilities. So you'd have two different links, so right? So you'd have students linked to one code right. and you'd have teachers linked to another code. Seminar. And then you, you could show the screens next to each other. Um, um, the, the school that's done it is making community connections, MC squared. So we basically share almost everything with the students. I mean, virtually everything with the students and it's a, it's a shared conversation. I, I'm not gonna call on people, go ahead and like talk. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, can you talk about uh, what the response, like what was the, di what dialogue would that produce? What, what, how, how did things shift and change when you had staff and students do that exercise? And then what were some of the outcomes from that shared work? So over the years, um, and it's been, let's see, a total of about 20 years now that MC Squared's been in operation. And those kinds of conversations happen all the time. Um, like I can think of, this is not specific to the TCM, the transformational change model, but we had a similar conversation around test results. We put it up there and, and they worked in small groups, staff mixed with students uh, around um, making meaning of what they saw. And the result of that whole conversation was the students in particular recommended some changes to how testing was run. And we implemented those changes. Like they got to choose what time of day they were gonna take the test. They, they got to choose if they were gonna be in a small room with only a couple people or in a room with more people. Like those aren't factors that, that the test is testing for, right? That, that's not, so that's one example. With the, with the transformational change um, analysis, the gap assessment, you know, the, the school is designed on the transformational column. Everything about the school is designed over there. So to a large extent, what we have to do is dig into specific ones and say, how can we be better at what we're doing? As opposed to, do we want to do this or not? It's not so much a conversation of, do we want to do it? it, it rather, it's, um, are we doing it well? And how can we get better? What's our next best um, place to be? So I don't think that specifically answers your question, but hopefully it well, gets you along the way. I, I wanna I wanna underscore one thing that you just said. Uh, and then it looks like Casey has a question in the chat. The thing I wanted to underscore that you said was that this tool, when it's used in a culture where the primary culture is one of reflection and metacognition is very different than if this tool was being used in a community where nobody had ever been asked what they thought before. So like as two examples of easy uh, innovations that MC Square did that every school could adopt but don't. Um, every student at MC Square would do something called an EOD, an end of day assessment. And it was just like an email to their, it, an email that went directly to their advisor and to their parents. And you know, it was 10 minutes and some days kids didn't really have anything to say and some days they had a lot, but it was building a culture of reflection. And Kim as the director would also write her own EODs to her staff. So when you have that kind of a culture and then you do a tool like this, it's more useful. And so to me, I think the, the root of it is inviting and inviting again people to talk. Um, I see Daniel has his hand up. So Daniel, maybe you ask your question and then Casey, maybe you hop in after. Yeah, I'm just gonna add one quick thing that the, the slideshow I showed you is a really pared down version of a presentation I did last week on developing student identity and agency. And there are pieces in there about the end of days, about the habits that are coached and scaffolded. And I'd be happy to share um, a PDF of the entire slideshow so you can see the resources to those other pieces. They still do end of days. Remember agency is action and reflection. We have to teach scaffold and build capacity for reflection on everybody's part, not just the kids. 
Thanks, Kim. It, it, it's so good to see you in, the, in this context. It's been a, it's been a while. Um, I'd like to make public a, a conversation we've been having for a couple of decades now around transformation, and, and it's related to what we our core beliefs as educators and then our core practices and as a, as a transformational tool. And, and we, could, we could do it as, a, as an institution. We, we could look at the school's vision statement or mission statement that's written on the wall and look at the practices that are happening in the classroom. And if there's a gap there, I consider that an integrity gap because we're not practicing our beliefs. So when we can have the educators identify core transformational beliefs that they hold and reflect on their practice in terms of which ways is my practice um, working towards these values and goals and in what ways is it not and then get feedback from your colleagues how your practice could more closely align with your core values and beliefs. I think that's transformational. My sense is, is many teachers in schools have this vision of democracy, student voice, agency, uh, contributing to the greater good of the community, but the practices don't, don't suggest that. So have, this reflection that you're calling for can happen on many different levels. And the conversation, I think, for me, is the most transformational conversation is how do we move from our current practice to our, to it more closely towards our core beliefs, our ideals? which are transformational. I wanted to try to jump in and just say, hi, Daniel. Uh, it's been a while. <laughs> um, wanted to make the connection uh, with the Native Americans that uh, you began with, uh, Kim. Uh, I think the phrase was, you are my other me, uh, which is uh, used, at, I believe, as the opening of each school day. And uh, at the... Uh, Mohawk Freedom School in upstate New York, uh, the Akasazni uh, Reservation. They begin with this uh, recitation where the students, particularly young ones, um, there's a huge mural across the end of one of the rooms and they all gather there or in another setting, it's actually down the hallway and they'll gather down the hallway and uh, in Mohawk, the students recite uh, what that is all about. And it's connecting to uh, all of the um, components of the universe, um, Mother Earth, uh, Mother Sky, Father Earth, uh, Universal Spirit throughout. And it's a very moving thing that that's how they begin every day. And I think uh, with the uh, thinking about uh, our uh, Native Americans, I think it's uh, one that uh, worth, worth mentioning. Thank you, Dave. I know Casey is about to hop in with a question, but I just want to name, we're at the top of the hour. So I'm going to suggest maybe I'm giving us all like a 10 minute warning, just so we have a sense about that. All right, Casey, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Kim, so wondering a couple things. Um, what were you learning that inspired these tools? You were doing reflection, I imagine, and thinking about your practice. How did, how did that spark these tools? And then once you use the tools, how do you facilitate a productive conversation with colleagues and, and students and others who might have very different beliefs and ideas? Yeah, that's a great question, Casey. Um, and it actually connects to um, how we had the tool, how we got feedback on the tool over time. So the, the transformational change model is the tool that got lots of feedback over time. And it, uh, it was developed because of um, a couple of things. So one, I'm gonna give its deep roots credit to national school reform faculty and school reform initiative. Um, two organizations that used to be one and developed a lot of practices um, to help adults look at the gaps, as Daniel was saying, between their beliefs and their practices and to surface and test assumptions and beliefs, because that's, that's how we change our mental models. And I'd been involved in that work over many, many years. And um, 
also worked, I, I started four schools in my career and each one had certain successes and other challenges. And I was trying to find a way to encapsulate what what it looked what it looked like, what the goals were. Um, I was part of Coalition of Essential Schools for many years as well, which deeply informed my thinking about a lot of this work. And so I started trying to capture um, uh, snapshots or descriptors that that caught the kind of school we were aspiring for. I started first developing this, I want to say in 2007. And that was during the first iteration of MC Squared. And we knew the school board was going to shut us down. We decided to start a nonprofit QED to continue the work we'd been doing with MC Squared and, and carry it forward and make it available to people for free. So over the next, I think it was six years, we did these different iterations with, with putting it in front of people, having people give us feedback. Um, so it was, it was a deeply synthesized and maple syrup kind of um, capturing of things we'd been working on and reflecting on in professional community for many years. The design of the tool um, is all the credit to Elizabeth Cardine, who's the master teacher still at MC Squared. And we, we would talk, whenever we would talk, I'd put my head down and I'd talk and she'd scribble because if I could she, see what she was scribbling, I would say, no, 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 that's not it. But if I didn't look at the end, there it was and it was brilliant. So she's the visual designer behind the presentation of the transformational change model. Um, and yeah, Sam, Sam knows Elizabeth's incredible uh, graphic design talent. So it's like a lot of people's thinking went into that work. The second half of your question is how do you have these conversations in productive ways comes back to the protocols for professional community. Um, how do we give voice to everybody? How, and it's back to status, like status is as important for adults. So how do we connect competence with belongingness and meaningfulness so that everybody believes that their voice makes a, has, has value and that they can impact the um, decisions or they can, they can have influence on the decisions that impact their lives. So we developed a whole bunch of different kinds of tools for affecting that kind of work and practices. And Carrie Thier, who's my other colleague who's on here and being very, very quiet, but she's working with me right now with the district we've been working with for five years that has been making some tremendous changes through implementing, um, we've got three major strands going, but basically out of our transformative learning collaborative, uh, our collective impact group came up with three pillars that can are necessary together to affect transformational change. And the first is leadership. The second is professional culture. And the third is mind, brain, and education science. And we, we visited schools around the country. We developed a set of um, practices. And basically, if any one of those three, just like any three-legged stool, if you have great leadership and professional culture, but you're not looking at the mind, brain, and learning sciences, your stool is going to be tipsy. So you, you need all three of those things together. And we've just been developing tools and practices to support those conversations. Um, one place to start is to have people look at the gap analysis and then talk in small groups, make meaning of what, you know, talk about what do they see, what, what's coming up for them, not come in and tell them what it means. That's the key thing. Um, and that's why the sense making work that we've in, we've started to uncover through the pedagogy group and PNI with Fisher has been so gets me so jazzed because it's another way to um, incorporate all voices into that sense making. Carrie, do you want to say anything? You're saying such good things, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> the question that maybe Carrie can answer. I don't know. So when you talk about working with districts, who, what districts are you working with and what so, what's their so, like, could you give me like a snapshot of, shop of their snapshot of their demographic? And in demographic, I mean like urban versus rural and, and mostly just size of staff versus size of student population. 
So I'd say between Carrie, myself, and Daniel here on the call, when we're all part of that transformative learning collaborative, it's pretty diverse. Um, the, the district I just mentioned that we've been working with for five years is a rural, a semi-rural district. It's, it's um, got 23, is it 23 towns? I don't know. I think it's 23 towns that makes one district. And so they have a bunch of little elementary schools that feed into two middle schools and one high school and, and some very, um, very disparate kinds of socioeconomics across those districts. But we've, we've worked with districts around the country um, on this kind of work. I did, I, I think one of the more memorable um, stretches, I had three years I worked with a district in Illinois and I'm not going to name them because it wouldn't be fair. Yeah, you don't need name. I, I, that's what I mean. I don't, I don't need their names. I, I want to. Yeah, listen. but it's one of the one of the many districts that basically was a thriving metropolis and then was decimated as the um, industry that that supported their community moved overseas. And it just left behind um, a community like the streets or the the streets were empty. The store shelves were empty. This is way before the pandemic but they were committed to moving toward transformational practices. And we worked together over three years, they put together a really beautiful um, set of tools for their staff. They developed them, we facilitated their development of their putting together their own set of tools to personalize learning and do learner-centered work. Um, so, I mean, Carrie might want to throw in a couple others, or Daniel, I don't know, but well, those are a couple that I When we did, as the Transformational Learning Collaborative, we did uh, school observations in New York City, um, in Denver. So we've looked at small schools, big schools. Um, and then, you know, I think with all of us, our backgrounds too, we have tons of, you know, I've worked in probably 30 states across the country, you know, in different areas with little tiny, tiny districts and then real big districts, you know. But the, as part of our collaborative learning, testing out some of our tools, our, our observation tools, we did look at charters, we looked at public or public charters, we looked at, um, you know, district schools, and then the one that we've had this longest relationship with is, uh, it's fascinating, right? And so having a, a five or six year relationship with them and seeing what's changing over time, and the pandemic gave us a kind of an insight. It's like, what happens to a district when they have some of these practices in place, when everything goes sideways? And it changed the way they responded to the pandemic, I think, was in, impacted and, and inspired by some of the learning they had done, thinking about those three pillars. And so that was, it gave us an, an insight into how it could look, you know, how a public school system could respond differently if they were thinking about things differently. And, you know, I, I know we're almost out of time, but I feel like given how many of the questions, I feel like there's a common searching for a better understanding of both like process and leverage. Like what's the best way to do this? Where are the greatest leverage points? And some of us are thinking about that from this perspective of being classroom teachers, others as school leaders, but we also have on the call one of the country's greatest superintendents, I know she's retired now, but Pam Moran headed Albemarle County Public Schools in Virginia. And Pam, I mean, I know I'm just calling you out of the blue, but like, I'm curious from a, from a district superintendent's perspective, what are your what wisdom can you share the rest of us and how we best think about these core questions of like process and leverage and, you know, planting the seeds that hopefully sprout into the types of things that we're all hoping for? Like, where, where does your mind go when you think about this? Uh, I know, I know. <laughs> no. um, there, I mean, the, the people that are in this, this room tonight are such amazing thinkers and uh, people who have taken action that um, I, I'm, I feel very um, honored just to be here and to be able to listen tonight. But I think that what I learned over time, and it really was a build of a career, Sam, that first of all, 
you, you know, and I had a wonderful mentor who taught me some basic tenets of life. And one of them was that if you can't create a culture of yes, that really encourages kids and teachers and others that are working inside a system to uh, feel that they can take risk to really think creatively, that you will always be creating um, the hierarchical school system that really closes down ideas versus um, opens up what you might call a what if culture. And there are places that, you know, there are public schools all over the country that I've run into that really are working on this. One of the things also that we learned is that you have to take small steps because the, the scope of transformation that's really needed in my mind, and this is my opinion, and it's just my opinion, is so overwhelming that educators really struggle with the scope of it. And so what we tried to do was to take small steps to get people taking risk. And then what we could do is to really scale ideas, barring from Margaret Wheatley's work, that rather trying to cookie cutter change, what we tried to do was to say, if we're, if we're trying to really make this make sense for kids anywhere, whether in rural, tiny schools, large urban schools, and we kind of had them all, we've got to be able to let people's ideas seed, grow, spark, and then take those ideas, share them out, and let other people capture them and iterate in a way that would cause it to, to take off in other places. Um, in timeless learning, we really talk about the three big strategies that we went after was how do we become better observers? And I don't think you can be an observer, Kim, uh, without being a reflector, um, that we really tried to encourage zero-based thinking to get people to think about what, what would you build in a school if you didn't know what a school was supposed to be based on our, our traditions? what would you do to educate children if you were building from scratch, kind of the Stephen Levy work? Um, and then thirdly, we talked about imagination. How do we really unleash that creativity and imagination? And you got to create a safe culture for that because people are going to screw up and mistakes are going to happen. But if you realize that mistakes are not a life sentence, then you start to have people feel like that they can breathe and take the risk to try things that allow them to test bed and learn. I don't know. I, I, I probably am just, you know, I'm way too random <laughs> tonight, but. Um, Are you but, kidding? That's like, that's solid gold. So I did my best. I literally just tried to summarize them and it's now, we're just going to put it on a poster of Pam Moran's Rules of the Road. Um, and I, I just, I, I love being here and Kim, thrilled to, to be able to listen to you tonight and have followed the work of QED for a while. So really cool. And, and Sam, of course, is an icon for me. So it's great to be here with everyone. Thank you. I know we're just about at time, especially because my eight-year-old has come up and told me I need to put him to bed. But uh, I do have one thing I'd like to invite all of us to do at close, but Kim, I, I want to give you the last word before that of in whatever form you want to offer it. Mm, I have so many thoughts going on in my head right now. Um, I guess the first thought I want to say is call people in, don't call them out. Like invite people to the conversation, make them feel like there's a place for them, um, even when the conversations are hard. And we have, but to, if we want people to stay, if we want to get to the other side, we have to stay in the conversation. So calling people in, don't call people out. Um, and then the other thing that's on my mind lately is having listened to, um, uh, and I think we should share, I'll try to find the links and share them real quickly, but the um, two, two uh, podcasts that were for Turnaround for Children with Jeff, Dr. Jeff Duncan Andrade 
and he talks about pretty much what you were just saying, Pam, that, um, or actually maybe it was Bridget put it in the chat, that schooling is a process by which we teach kids to be compliant. Education is the way we teach them how to transform their world. And those are two very different things. And we really want to pay attention to that. So I come back again to um, agency for everybody, identity for everybody, and the definition of equity that includes positive sociocultural and linguistic identity and equity literacy, being able to take action. Um, so I guess those are the last things I'd say. And if, if you do go play with the tools and you have questions or feedback, please let me know. Um, we're, my team, my colleagues, we're, we're here to um, help you and support you in your work. And Kim, I think almost everybody has it, but maybe drop your contact information into the chat. There is always uh, that piece, isn't there? We're, we're gonna be able to um, thank Kim in a minute, but I wanna give us a chance first to thank her and each other in a different way, which is um, the, what is the, it from the last hour and 15 minutes, like what's the, what's the biggest juiciest chestnut in your mouth right now? And maybe it's an idea, maybe it's a question, um, points for brevity. So like, you know, a clause, this is not a time to give a speech because we want to hear as many different chestnuts as possible. Gap so, analysis and the integrity gap. Agency is action plus reflection. You're never done. But people are doing this work, even though I'm amidst what I perceive as a highly dysfunctional place that's not doing it, there are districts doing it. That's refreshing and reassuring to me. Call people in, don't call them out. Dedication to learning. Listen to the students. Yeah. <laughs> Share. A community of educators and children. EODs. Actions matching beliefs. Exponential serendipity. And with that, if you would please take yourself off mute and let's end tonight by giving gratitude to Kim and her team for everything that they shared with us and to each other for showing up. Bravo. 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 Thank you. Bravo. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo. Have a great night.